like gratitude is something you feel towards something and you can say well i don't feel it towards anything in particular and i would say all right well the diffuse nothing that you feel it towards serves in your psychological hierarchy as your equivalent of god oh uh, so, no but it's gratitude you know this morning for example i looked out and it was so um green uh, we've had frosts and it's been white the last few days and it was green this morning and it was just gratitude to the universe if you like it's not really god because it's not a creator it's not anything i can pray to it's i mean i know well, i feel gratitude towards it then. i don't know but i find That's it fine. I, I know that you tackle in this book that that happiness is not an ultimate good and i i no, struggle no, this way it's not an ultimate goal oh, okay i didn't all right. say it wasn't an ultimate all right good. all right okay you're, There's a big you, difference you, you, yes, between you're those right, things. You're right. You pick me up correctly on that. Um, nevertheless, we are happiness-seeking creatures, and I have found through practice and growing older that acting gratitude, thinking gratitude, feeling gratitude makes me happier and seems to okay, kind of so rub off I, on other okay, people. So I, I don't. I don't think a... we are happiness-seeking creatures, and I think it's a low goal. Not because there's something wrong with being happy because, you know, thank God if you get to be happy now and then. But I don't think that that's what we seek. I think we seek a meaning that's deep enough to sustain us through tragedy. And that is way different. Do you know, when I hit some, I, I, tragedy is too strong a word, um, I think. I'm, I, but if when, I, when, I, when horrible things happen to me or I feel or I read some terrible thing going on in the world. Yes, those are tragedies going on in the world. Um, my response is nothing matters it's all empty and meaningless this is how the world is get used to it get on with it girl that sounds like a very zen buddhist way of dealing i guess with, it i with, guess it is well it's a fun, it's a paradoxical way though because it is the kind first of paradoxical. the first part of that is nihilistic and the second part isn't so well, how do you reconcile those two things it, which, why get on with it girl because oh oh well here's another thing i've often done this with my students let's suppose you become nihilistic uh, nothing matters. There's no point in doing it. I mean, I think we live in a pointless universe. What are you going to do? And I say to them, like William James in his wonderful thing about getting up in the morning. Um, but that's a slightly different point that he makes there. But I say to them, OK, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, think it's all pointless. I d there's no point in doing anything. Now, what are you going to do? Well, actually, you're going to need to go to the loo. You're going to get out of bed and you're going to go to the bathroom. And when you're there, you'll think, well, actually, I'm hungry. I think, well, I think I want to go down to the kitchen. Oh, I probably should put my slippers on. Why don't I get dressed? You go and have something to eat. And then you think, I'm bored. And you go to university and go into your lectures. And, you know, we are not creatures who will just not do anything. To me, to go through that process, which I've done in the past a lot, and it's just natural now, is, um, is, a, is a very positive way of living to accept the meaningless and ultimate emptiness of everything and accept that this creature here, this thing, this evolved creature just will get on with life. But, but, but you're not accepting the meaninglessness of it, even by going through those actions that you, you described. You don't think so? Not well, at all, because you're, you because you're acting as if those well, things are meaningful. Yes, I am. I'm right. acting okay. as though those so things let, are meaningful. Are you okay. pretending so that they're meaningful? Pardon? Are you pretending that they're meaningful? No, I'm not pretending. I'm, I'm, my way of putting it would be that those meanings are constructed by myself and others. They're personal and, and right. they're because, meanings other than... Because but, the kind of creatures we are, because of the meme, meme plexes... But they're plexes, not constructed. Because, I'd like to hear Jordan's response to this. Neither is your desire to use the loo. None of that's constructed. No, no. But the fact that there is a loo <laughs> is part yes. of the culture. Yeah, well, thank God for that. that. Yeah. 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 But see, oh, you see, thank God we're using that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a poor joke. Well, you see, <laughs> see, so imagine this. You, you have the proximal meanings that you describe that are sort of a priori, right? Yep. They're handed to you. You might consider them as needs or drives, although they're yes. not. They're personalities. That's not the right way of conceptualizing them. Um, but, but then there's the intermingling of all those needs and drives, let's say. And that, that constitutes a new layer of structure because it isn't just that you have to eat and that you have to use the washroom and that you have to have something to drink and that you have to be warm enough or cool enough to survive. It's that you have to do all those things at the same time in a situation where you're going to have to propagate that across time and you're going to have to do it with a bunch of other people. Yep. And it's always been like that. And yep. so what that means is that out of those proximal meanings, higher meanings arise. And you might say, well, those meanings are arbitrary. And I would think I those are religious meanings. I wouldn't meanings. say they are arbitrary, but I would say they were constructed. It's very interesting. Reading well, your what book. What do you mean by constructed? Um, well, they are a consequence of, of mimetic evolution, of the, of the language that, that people are brought up in, the culture they live in, the arguments they have. I mean, What about the biology that they're given? Well, we start with the biology and the memes build on top of that. Culture now the memes are biology too. Well, by definition, they are, well. 
See, this I, is I the would thing. Fo- I would follow thing. Dawkins in saying, well, talk about genes as biology, talk about memes as culture. That's all I meant by dividing that. But let me say this. Yeah, Re- but I don't accept that division. But I, don't I want think to get back to what we're saying division. about meaning. Well, reading, reading your book made me think a lot about what, what you mean by meaning and your claim that we should have a meaningful life or strive for a meaningful life, that meaningfulness is important. And I kept asking myself, do I... Uh, do I live that way? What meanings does my life have? And, you know, if I think of something like, well, the, most of my striving goes into writing my books. <laughs> and is that meaningful? And again, I have the same response when I ask myself that question. It's just what this body does. It, it, then it, you should listen to the body and stop listening to the thing that's criticizing it. And what would the body say? It would say, write your book and try to be as clear as you yeah, possibly can about it. Yeah, that's what I do. It. And that's right, exactly, exactly what I do. What I said at the beginning is that the atheist types act out a religious structure and no, criticize it. No, there's no religious well, structure. Oh, let, we let come me get, to this big get, question Let me get now. to this question because yes, I did have. want to get to this because you, you have a fascinating part in your book, um, Jordan, where you, you do say this. You're simply not addressing atheists. You say you're simply not an atheist in your actions. And it is your actions. Or if that you most are, ac- look out. <laughs> and it is your actions that most accurately reflect your religious beliefs. What do you mean by that? Why are you saying that no one is really an atheist deep down? I didn't say no one was. Okay. I said that most of the people who claim to be atheists aren't. So this is why I like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, because Raskolnikov tried to act like an atheist. Right? He he took the ideas that were floating around. Dostoevsky took the ideas that were floating around in the late 1800s, which are still the ideas that we're discussing today. One most fundamental idea, I suppose, being after Nietzsche's uh, announcement of the death of God, that if there is no God, then anything is permitted. That was Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov is the criminal in crime and punishment, the murderer. He gets away with his murder, uh, you know, technically, but not psychologically. And he decides that if there's no God, anything is permitted. But and this can't doesn't see have to be true. That's a that's a a, a, a person in a, a character in a novel. Um, I don't think that that's so. Well, let, let's hear the end of that story. And what 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 do you take away from what Dostoevsky has to say about? Well, Dostoevsky's takeaway was two: was that there was a moral law that Raskolnikov was breaking, even though he he rationalized his way through it. Like he committed the perfect murder, right? Mm. He murdered a woman who people would have voted to murder, Mm. and then he got away with it. And he did it for good reasons, at least reasons that he could Mm. rationalize as good. And then he got away with it, but it destroyed his soul. And And Dostoevsky's right about that. And one of the things I like about Dostoevsky as compared to Nietzsche, say, because I think Dostoevsky is the profounder of the two, is that in in the Brothers Karamazov, for example, Ivan is the atheist, and Ivan is everyone, everything you'd want a man to be, like seriously. And Dostoevsky, man, he doesn't straw man his opponents. Mm. The most powerful characters in his books are always the opponents of what he himself believes. And Ivan is always arguing with Alyosha, who's his younger brother, who's a monastic novitiate and really can't articulate himself very well, has nowhere near the force or charisma of Ivan. Mm -hmm. But Alyosha wins the drama, even even though he loses all the arguments. And that's where Dostoevsky is so great. It's like, and and, and this is what you're doing in your life. You're you're acting, look, you're acting out the logo, Susan. That's what you're doing. You're writing books to illuminate the world. You say, well, I don't believe in that. Yes, you do. Don't you think it's kind of uh, offensive to say to me that that I'm not an atheist when I am? I, 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 why don't, answer me this question. Why do you think I don't go around murdering people? Why do you think I go around trying to be um, I don't know you well enough to know. <laughs> because I could have done some. <laughs> I think often right. the reason that people done. don't do it is because they're too cowardly. Oh, that could be a reason. It could be that I don't murder people. I'd really no. Love I'm not to. necessarily <laughs> saying <laughs> no, you. No, it's well, a possible one. It's all in right, fact highly right. likely. At yes. sometimes in your life, but if you're a normal very... person, <laughs> <laughs> we're needing to well, close things out. And and I, I, I know I know it's it's we've had not long enough. But Jordan, just come back to this because I want to hear why ultimately. Despite everything that Sue said there, you still think she's behaving as though there is, in some sense, a God or some ultimate meaning, even though she protests that, no, that's that's. Well, I would say she's acting it out. Well, for example, the act of writing a book. I mean, the Judeo-Christian culture is the culture of the book. It's it's the revelation of the proper mode of being in written form. It's not only that, but it's it's a large it's a large part of that. It's the culture of the book. You're acting out the culture of the book. It's thousands of years old, and the voice, the true voice in the culture of the book, is the logos. That's what it is, technically speaking. 
And so she's acting out the logos and writing a book. It's like, and then she says, well, I don't believe in God. It's like, okay, that's the, fine. The logos, acting of course, acting like in, you do is fine. In, in scripture, do. in the New Testament, is, is, the word. Brought, is brought into the word. And it, of course, yes, relates the word to, that brings order and, out of and chaos. to Jesus Christ as, yes. as the sort of personification almost of that. Right. Uh, He's the archetypal manifestation of the logos. I mean, that's, that's, uh, these are all big words and things. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of people will be asking, what do you actually make of in Christian terms, the figure of Jesus. Do do you believe that he was in some sense um, divine? Was there, you know, when you look at what the Bible tells us about Jesus? Well, one thing you might ask yourself is, do you believe that each individual is divine in some sense? And I would say, well, perhaps not, but you act as though you do. And our law acts as if it does. It's predicated on that idea because the sovereignty of the individual is the divinity of the individual. There's no difference between those two things. And I can make an absolutely brutally clear case for the development of that idea historically. Mm, mm. I've traced it back to Mesopotamia, at least in its earliest written forms. I mean, originally the only real sovereign individuals were, were the sovereigns, right? The, mm. the emperors mm. and pharaohs. But that the idea of the sovereign individual descended down the hierarchy of power, so to speak, until with Christianity it was universalized. We're each sovereign individuals, and that means that the law itself is written as if we each contain a spark of divinity. And so then I think, well, what is that divinity? And in the Christian worldview, well, that's the logos. That's the true speech that brings forth habitable and good order from the chaos of and, potential. And in your view, whether she likes it or not.